أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من همزه ونفخه نفسه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وين تستعد عارف إن شاء الله with check-ins good check-ins how was your weekend how are you navigating your various challenges what kind of challenges are you coming across in, in setting up your visions and assessing them and you know, navigating them? Um, are there anything specifically that you would like to go over? Any suggestions that you would like help? Like you would need, like that you would like um, any resources or training that you wish that the community had uh, or that had more of? Anything in this in this topic? So this is the current, uh, what we're focusing on examples of this process right here, kind of analyzing, assessing where you're at currently and being able to, you know, be objective, figuring out how to assess yourself. Uh, we're giving examples now of how different people applied steps two, one, and zero. Zero was about being realistic and not, uh, like, uh, not, not being um, realistic. Okay, so we had covered these stories and I removed some of the slides that I were focusing on the different relationships and stuff that people go off on. So I just wanted to focus on um, like what we have covered so far in, in a specific example. And today I wanted to go over uh, the revert example. And this revert example is where um, there was a revert and this is a sister and uh, she had taken the shahada. So I followed up and I said, um, what are the, some, one of the first things that she should focus on? And among the first things that she should focus on that I suggested were character development, because this is how in the beginning Islam you know, was focused on a lot of character development and you know, relationship building and so on, understanding how to navigate various contexts and so on, and just being uh, you know, a person who is prone uh, or who is more, uh, I, I guess, like more focused on humanitarian efforts and like looking out for the community and so on. And I mentioned that at the end of the Quran, which were the, among the first revelations, that you know, Allah SWT has sent down examples of these kinds of good things that you could do, poor, feed the poor people, look out for orphans, look out for the needy and stuff, and take care of people in general, right? So this was the idea um, that I suggested that we should be focused on. And there's a hadith from the Prophet ﷺ that he said that in Namah Bu'ais to uh, that, that I, I was perfect, I was sent to, um, I was sent and he used the word inama to uh, as if to imply exclusivity as in that was the only purpose right so um and there's other narrations on this other versions of the hadith um uh, like you know so it goes i was only sent to perfect uh, or i was sent to perfect good and noble character another one is like you know perfect character another narration has other uh, endings to it but they mean the same thing essentially like you know perfect noble righteous good character essentially to perfect that, that that's one of the reasons or the main reason he was sent as he, he, he said it in a way to imply that um, and so i suggested that and i suggested that you know one of the first things that you need to focus on now is to uh, focus on your prayers five prayers are most important and this is pretty much the first, this is, this is one of those things that no matter if you're sick or if you are paralyzed or if something's wrong with you and stuff, right? No matter what, um, you have to pray. You have to pray. And women have an exception during the time of, you know, the monthly cycles um, for this. But when it comes to um, salah, for example, just in general, um, it is one of those things that you are required to do, even if you have to pray with your eyes and stuff like that because you're paralyzed, for example. Or even if it's something that you know, you, um, time it's like a, you know, it's difficult on you and stuff or whatever. But it's still, you have to pray these five things. So, and you know, if on the day of judgment, there's a hadith from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that on the day of judgment, um, one, the first thing that's going to be looked at is your prayers. And if it's not fulfilled and stuff, and like the obligatory ones are not, if the obligatory ones are not fulfilled, then the the extra ones are going to be looked at to see if there's any kind of. Uh, in any way that some of the oh, the like defects in the obligatory ones uh, would be fulfilled right? so if you prayed let's say fajr for example but you were half concentrating half not whatever or whatever the you know the percentage was then this would sort of fit, like fill in the gap these extra voluntary prayers and stuff 
would fill in the gap as, as if they were extra credit essentially, right? So if you had, for example, a test and it was like a 79 you got on that test and you had, let's say, if you know, some some other assignments that you had completed, whatever, like extra credit stuff, you might be able to get your, uh, your like 79 up to, let's say, an 83 or something like that, right? So this is where voluntary prayers are very useful um, because a lot of us are not 100% focused on our prayers and stuff and a lot of us are not 100% focused on the meaning of everything that we're saying and our forms are perfect and stuff and we're having this khushu in our salah and stuff like that. So we all have the, these deficiencies and so on. And then having these extra um, extra credits are useful in that case, inshallah. So it can help um, add on uh, some points, let's say, to the, the salah, for example. And there's a hadith from the Prophet, or there's an ayah in the Quran, um, and this is what there has a lot of discussion among the, the scholars of the generations and, and since then um, that Allah Taala accepts not, and this is this is in the story of the sons of Adam alayhi salam, um, uh, and in Surah Al Maidah, Allah Taala discusses some of the things that happened in the story of uh, the two sons of Adam alayhi salam, and one of them killed the other one, and so on, and so um, uh, one of them, the one that was good. He made the du'a, or no, he, he said that, um, he said to his brother, he said that Allah SWT does not accept except from al-muttaqun, right? And so from this, the scholars discussed this a lot, and they were worried about um, getting their deeds accepted. And so one of the righteous people, when he came to one of the early generation people, he said, um, he, he asked his son for some, you know, some, some coin or something like that. And uh, the son made a comment, and this person responded, he said, if I knew that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala had accepted even one sajda from me, I would, I would, you know, I would be ready to die. Essentially, I would ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to, you know, to take my life and stuff because I, I'd be satisfied and like I'd be ready to die because I'll know that like one thing got accepted. But he's like, and then he mentioned this ayah, and he said that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not accept except from al muttaqun right? So the idea is how many of us are guaranteed that we are from al muttaqun so that we would be assured that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala accepted even one of our good deeds and stuff, right? And so the idea is over here just making sure that you focus on perfecting your salah. And I wanted to add this, you know, emphasis on salah because um, some people do not put em emphasis um, on salah, and some people think that you know as long as you're Muslim and stuff like that, that you're good to go and stuff. You're gonna enter into Jannah and stuff like that, right? But that's a very um, premature, I'm gonna say, um, and I know that has a certain connotation, but I intend that connotation, uh, premature uh, understanding. Because the full understanding of Islam is that um, by itself, you know, just the shahada is not sufficient because uh, a person could say things and stuff like that that can lead that, lead that person out of Islam. They can say statements of kufr, for example, that would invalidate their, that would nullify uh, or cancel out their shahada. So shahada by itself is not sufficient. You have to understand what are the boundaries of it and stuff. What does it entail? What do you, what are you not allowed to do as a result or say as a result of it and stuff and so on. But also it has some obligations and you know follow ups that are required as part of its acceptance. And among those are um, you know actions and stuff like that. So it's not just belief; it's also actions, and that's what iman is. It's a composition of um, actions and beliefs and so and so on. And Imam Abu Hanifa had this. Uh, um, one of the it was a minor opinion, a minority opinion, but he he had this opinion that, um, and this is not the predominant opinion and stuff, but it is something that we all, all want to discuss because he had caveats in it as well. So even even he himself uh, sort of sided with the majority in this case, and that is that iman uh, is one thing, and then uh, it's a, you know iman in your heart and in your tongue, but uh, you know when it comes to actions then the actions uh, are separate, but he said your iman is not complete essentially, or it's, it's, you know, it's not perfect without actions and stuff. So he sort of lumped them together still. So it, it was just more semantics and not necessarily like, you know, like differences and more than that. So the idea is the same, that actions are very important. And we'll see this in the Quran many times when Allah Shadana mentions the people that believe, he also mentions they do righteous good deeds and stuff. And so um, uh, prayers are very important, right? And this is pretty much the core at the building, building blocks of everything else that goes on top of that. If you're missing salah, then you could be the most active, person, active person in your community and all these things, but you have a major flaw and it might be that your, your deeds are not gonna necessarily be weighed much um, because you're missing the salah, right? And in the hadith where the Prophet and mentioned about salah, he also mentioned that if, if the prayers are incomplete or if it's defective and stuff, and, and you know, even the voluntary prayers are not sufficient, um, suffice in terms of like how much like uh, in terms of the end result let's say you have like a like a 30 percent on your prayers and then like your voluntary prayers added like maybe five points then you have a 35 you still failed right you know in, in the concept uh, if you have like you know let's say 70 is passing 
as, as people have it nowadays. Let's assume that. So in that case, you still failed. And so every other deed is going to be negatively impacted, even if it was like, you know, these great deeds that you've done and stuff. Because the first thing that we're required to do after Shahada is Salah. And Salah is one of those things that you can't really get out. You can't pay ransom like you can for um, for, for fasting. If you can't fast Ramadan because of sickness and stuff, you can you can give some fidya, um, some um, some money to kind of compensate um, for the, the fast. Sort of like, you know, you can get ransom for it essentially, right? But when it comes to fasting, or when it comes to prayer, that's not possible. So if you're missing prayers, just just keep in mind that everything else, therefore, is neg like it's, it's it's negatively impacted, and uh, it's not it's not something to play around with, and it's not something to think that you know. That's fifteen minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So I I mentioned to this individual that they should focus on sincerity, and uh, they should focus on. Uh, sorry, I, I mentioned to them that they should focus on prayer. Uh, and pretty much build that up and you know for, for reverts in the very beginning as they're learning and they have to keep learning and stuff right but as they're learning starting off the prayer is going to be very simple uh, they still have to make the same movements essentially right but the words that they say because they haven't necessarily memorized that yet because it might it might have been like one or two days and stuff since they became muslim and stuff right so they can say things like subhanallah alhamdulillah Allah, but and so on um, instead of saying like you know that um, hands because they have memorized it and they still have to pray so even a revert has to pray even though they haven't actually mastered all the phrasings and stuff like that and so things like Allahu Akbar Subhanallah Alhamdulillah would be some things that they would say throughout the prayer right as they learn as they continue learning about Surah Fatiha and like other surahs and stuff like that to be able to sufficiently so sufficiently uh, meet their requirements there's a rule in fiqh which is that if a, if an obligatory action cannot be done in full then whatever part of it can be done is still required. So even if you can't f fulfill like the entire like full set of things, you still have to uh, meet whatever you, you can. So you can't just like forego it completely. Um, and so in this case, if you are praying, uh, for example, and you don't know how to say Fatiha, you still have to pray Fatiha. You still have to pray, you know, you have to go to the motions and stuff like that. But if you can't say Fatiha, then you have a backup um, and you have, to, you have to say that. But it comes with a condition that you're actively uh, seeking the the rest of the uh, components that you have not been able to do yet, but if you're not doing that, then you're you're um, you're you, you will be held accountable for that. So keep that in mind that you have to actively keep trying to fulfill at least the bare minimums. Um, and if you're not able to meet the bare minimums, then whatever it is that you can fill, you should allow it before. But you have to keep trying to go towards the bare minimum at least, and beyond that, ideally, uh, because you don't want to just depend on your bare minimums because it might be like you know, um, it may not be sufficient because we still have you know. Uh, we still fall short in certain things that we do. So with that in mind, um, this this particular individual, they were super excited about, you know, wanting to learn about Islam and so on, and they wanted to just become like the perfect Muslim because they were so happy with connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were Christian before, but um, this person then, you know, became Muslim and they were super excited. They were like, this makes perfect sense and stuff. I'm, you know, I'm all for it. And I want to just become, I want to, they started praying to Hajj at night and stuff like that. They started praying, you know, five times a day and stuff. They wanted to like, like read through the Quran and stuff. They wanted to like go through the books of Hadith, for example, and like, you know, books of like, uh, you know, they wanted to go through all of these things and stuff, right? And they wanted to do that, like, you know, as soon as possible. They were just so excited about it. They had this huge momentum, right? So I, I figured this is, you know, I figured sort of like where it's, where, what the trend is looking like, what the pattern is looking like, because many people, uh, people that have been Muslim for a long time, but they have been actually like, you know, live in Islam. They've just been like, they inherited Islam. So they're inherited Muslims and stuff, not actually because they chose to be Muslims and stuff. And uh, meaning that they're living a different life, but they have this title of Islam, right? Um, anyways, so a lot of them, when they uh, become Muslim, or not, not become Muslim, when they, um, when they get back into Islam and they actually focus on it, like they actually appreciate and they want to become closer to Allah SWT, then they have the same sort of like, you know, this, uh, you know, this motivation, this high, right? And new Muslims and reverts and so on, they have the same high in the very beginning. And so what happens is they want to do everything all at once. But when that obviously does not take place um, because it's, it's not sustainable, right? They burn out. Then in that case, they sort of like fall back and stuff like that. So one of the things that I advise them to do is to go start off slow focus on the bare minimums that are necessary and then you'll build up from there, right? So cover those things before you get into something that you're not going to be able to breathe through and stuff because you overwhelm yourself. So it's more like instead of sprinting um, and just sort of like running out of breath, um, uh, and then you instead focus on uh, going very slowly. So one of the fastest animals in the world, right? The, um, 
my goal is like 75, 70 miles an hour, but it can only sustain that for a brief moment. It has like a very, like it has a surge. Um, uh, it has like a, it has a, it has like a, you know, a sudden boost of, you know, or a certain like, you know, uh, just like, it just, it just runs. I mean, it has like this like initial, like, you know, amount of energy and it just like takes it all out in a very quick, like rush towards the prey. Um, so it, you know, what happens is um, this cheetah might travel at 70 miles an hour and going after a gazelle, for example. And as it's doing that, then um, it, it immediately, all its like energy sort of gets drained immediately, right? And it's not able to sustain it. Whereas if you have like, you know, um, wolves, for example, wolves will keep on running and running and running and running and they just keep on pursuing their prey for a very long time. So if a wolf is chasing you versus a cheetah is chasing you, then just keep in mind that one of them is gonna run out of energy very quickly and it's gonna start panting and the other one is just gonna keep running the marathon for a very long time. So just keep in mind over here that um, whenever we wanna do something, we get really hyped up. You know, you might go to a conference and you get like, a, you know, like an Iman high, for example, and then you just wanna do everything at once and then you sort of are, you find yourself not able to sustain it and you're exhausted and you sort of give up. And a lot of people, when they become Muslims, um, or they, you know, get back and they get back into team. They they do this, and then eventually it makes it so overwhelming for them that they're not able to sustain, and they even end up giving up Islam because they thought Islam was all really heavy and it's like really difficult and stuff like that. When it's not, it was just they made their own mistakes, and that's it. They they misunderstood Islam. They didn't learn it correctly. They didn't apply it correctly. They sort of like overwhelmed themselves, and instead of you know sort of like evaluating themselves and assessing themselves. They blame Islam for it or they blame like you know other people and stuff for it so this is where um the assessment aspect uh you know step number two uh was flawed and also step zero was flawed because they thought reality was something when it was actually not the same as they had thought and they didn't really correct themselves and so on and yeah that's that's that so um this person they they had this boost they wanted to learn everything and stuff so i advise them focus on these two things prayer and character just that's it focus on nothing else right now just as, as soon as you're able to sustain this for some time, then we'll add on one more piece to it. And then we'll add on something after that one piece is sustained and stuff. And then we'll keep on doing that as we move forward. So this person, I guess, you know, they were still hyped up and stuff. And so they figured they could do more. And then I was just clear of like giving them a bargain and stuff. And they could actually do more than that. They could sustain more than that, which was understandable because they had this emotional high and they were still new to this time and so on. So anyways, when I say new, I don't mean like they were new because, uh, in the sense that they were never Muslim before because we know from the Prophet that everyone is born as a Muslim uh, on the fitrah and then they, after they reach puberty and stuff, they can get off track and stuff, right? So that, what, that's what I mean by new is that they have, you know, in their adulthood, after they had reached puberty, um, this was their first, you know, exposure to Islam. So that's what I mean by new Muslims um, and so on. So anyways, uh, and this is different than a person who has been Muslim before. But you know, after puberty, but then they sort of like got lost or they did other stuff or whatever, and then they came back and had a boost to come back to Islam because of a life experience or whatever, or they heard a you know a, you know something or whatever. Um, so that's different. So, anyways, um, they, this person did this for they just you know overwhelmed themselves for uh, I think like maybe like you know seven eight months, and I followed up with them you know consistently to figure out what's going on and stuff like to make sure that they're able to sustain their. Um, their, their efforts um, and it, it turned out at the end like they would tell me that okay they're getting overwhelmed one time they found themselves you know in, in a very like, particular situation they're like I don't know why I'm getting myself into these things I'm, I'm falling short is Allah ever gonna forgive me I'm, I'm not you know I'm, I'm being so ungrateful to Allah and Allah's so nice to me and I don't even like you know what, how is Allah that gonna forgive me because he, he knows that I know better and stuff but I just keep doing I keep doing this and stuff and I feel it's like a like a hypocrite and stuff and so on so then I had to like sort of unpack and I said you know the definition of hypocrite there's two kinds of hypocrites and and then we discussed you know all those things and stuff and uh, then like you know sometime later Later, this person was still sort of like feeling this overwhelm so eventually um i sort of reminded them i said hey do you remember what we talked about uh, in the very beginning and i said you need to focus on your prayers and character and that's it don't focus on anything else because you're not going to be able to sustain it so let's go back to that and let's start off with just focusing on your prayers so in, you know let's try this for some time 
and whenever you get a chance, maybe like once a week or something like that, just update me, connect with me on your progress, on your prayers. If you're feeling you're overwhelmed, if you're not able to sustain something and stuff, we'll come up with strategies to help in that case, inshallah. But for now, just focus on your prayers and your character, and that's it, right? And that's it. Don't feel guilty if you're not doing everything just yet, because the only thing that's required of you right now um, is whatever you can actually swallow and actually like move forward with and sustain. Um, and that's prayer and the shahada you can do that and you know obviously you, like as you were talking about prayers um, in the in the past uh, or just a few minutes ago we were talking about prayer so there is customized prayers but you have to make the bare minimum so as you're learning more things if you're, as you're memorizing more surahs and stuff like that you do whatever it is that you can as long as you're continuously trying so as we did this um it was about like maybe 10 months or you know since they had uh, become muslim and um, then they started realizing how much of an impact I had like, like adding up so much on their plate had on them in terms of their sustainability. So alhamdulillah, now they were um, the last I connected with them. Um, this person was uh, focusing on their prayers and they were trying to sustain that. And um, they're, they're finding it a lot easier to sort of like, you know, actually maintain than what they had initially thought. And they're not feeling as guilty anymore. They're not blaming themselves for being such evil people and stuff. And, you know, that Allah SWT is never going to forgive them or so on. So that misconception about Islam and stuff has now been sort of disconnected. And so they were not having a misconception about Islam in this particular case. But um, other people do have that misconception that Allah is like, you know, putting too much burden on us and so on. So with that, um, I do want to make a note over here that when you work with you know reverts, make sure you continuously follow with them, follow up with them. If you're not gonna connect with them, then they will go through these highs, and they're gonna leave this down. They're gonna find it overwhelming and stuff. And it, part of it would be our responsibility because we didn't follow up with them. We just sort of gave them something. We didn't train them in it. And so yeah, even when I'm giving you tools over here, when I'm giving you the steps that we're going over, then even in these steps, we go over examples of how to do this, how to, you know, and then we give you time in the very beginning of these, um, in the unrecorded sessions, um, where we discuss, for example, what's going on um, uh, in, in terms of like, you know, how you're implementing these strategies and stuff like that. So that, that those, these are things that I'm trying to give to the public as well. So you guys, when you work with in your, in your context, that you also apply them, um, it, you know, accordingly. So. I'm not just going to give you steps and, and strategies and stuff that I'm um, that I'm not doing. I'm also going to be, you know, using these strategies myself, inshallah. And sometimes I I, I give you uh, my strategies that you might not have caught, but I'm I'm giving those strategies so that you can uh, like. Uh, okay, I, I I mentioned these strategies um, that I might not have initially mentioned, um, but and you might not have noticed them, and I mentioned them. Um, I'm opening them up for you so that you can use them because I want you to see that I am using certain strategies even for us, right? So when I said, for example, that give them steps, but also sort of follow up with them, that's what I've been doing. If you've noticed, I give you steps, we go over how to do them, and then we also follow up in the beginning of the sessions with these, like, you know, the check-ins and so on. So this is how we need to make sure that we're continuously working with them. Anything that you do, we want to make sure you're doing that with you, with, you know, new Muslims, with, with anyone that you're working with, your kids, for example, with your spouses, with, with your parents, with your friends, anytime you're working with them in any ways, make sure you do that. Whether you're doing it in an organization, whether you're doing it outside of an organization, whether you're in leadership or whatever it is, make sure you're following some of these strategies, inshallah. Okay, so um, some things, uh, and um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to mention and like maybe the first one um if i have time if the timer doesn't run out then um, i'll go into the second one but um, i'll start with this in terms of, so uh, this is something um uh, when it comes to stock markets um if a person wants to get into the stock market and you know like these uh no fees uh, like when, when you have uh, stocks that you're buying nowadays there are many of these platforms that allow you to trade without any kind of transaction fees for example or brokerage fees and stuff so these are free trading essentially, right? Um, and they make money through other services that they provide, for example, stock analysis and like, you know, feedback and so on. Um, so what happens is when a person sees the initial price that a stock had come in with, right? Like let's say the IPO, for example, the initial public offering was at a certain price, for example, right? Let's say it was like $20 or something like that, right? What happens is people sort of remember that price. And every time after that, when the price is at the stock, Price is going away from that original point, they become more and more uh, sort of uh, deterrent 
from for, uh, buying the stock at that higher price now. And this continues happening, and the more that happens, the more the price is going up, the more they start feeling like, man, it's too expensive now. You know, I'm just waiting for the price to come back down to a lower level and stuff closer to the original price. And uh, if a person didn't know the IPO, or maybe like it was like, you know, a different time when they purchased the stock, so whatever price that they purchased the first time, right, they're gonna try to, do, they're gonna think the same way for that. Anytime the price is going above that, they're gonna start to feel, feel deterred to buy it, right? And then this will continue onwards and stuff, and they'll miss out an opportunity. So the um, and this is called analysis paralysis, and I gave more examples of that. But for this, it's called price anchoring. Your anchor over here, just like if you remember, we talked about the uh, negative memory anchors that are holding you back, right? Um, so uh, in here, um, the price anchoring is that price anchor is holding you down to that particular number that you had purchased at initially, and every time the price of the stock is going higher and higher you're gonna be deterred from buying it. Now, of course, when you're buying stocks systemically, uh, you wanna make sure that these are Sharia compliant and there are software out there. Uh, there are services out there that have been screening stocks and stuff and they're looking at their financial reports, you look at their debts, they look at the interest that's involved and stuff, right? So they look at that and then they, they determine um, how, what kind of, uh, like if these stocks are Sharia compliant or not. And then um, some stocks might have, they might be Sharia compliant, but they have this element of like, you know, interest, for example, or so on. Um, or some haram and stuff or whatever and so um like you you can look at the notes that these uh, apps have um, or these screening apps have or software have that I tell you on how to do uh, zakat on this and stuff and, and how not to do like in, that's a 30 minute mark yeah okay so um let me just finish up inshallah on this point so uh the the um you, you should have that done when it comes to purification of your wealth and when it comes to the income that you make from that stock that has some doubt in it or whatever, or some haram in it, um, but it was still classed as you know, a Sharia compliant, that you should make sure that you would take away that portion that, you know, like if, if it was like 10% of like, you know, haram, whatever, um, and it was, let's say, still, you know, marked as Sharia compliant, then you want to take that 10% of profits and then get rid of it and stuff, right? And then uh, also you should purify your wealth with zakat and so on and stuff like that. So keep that in mind that there, there is that Sharia compliancy that you need to go to. Um, but let's say you found those stocks that are good and Sharia compliant, and there are several of them that are like that. Um, some of them are like 100% Sharia compliant because they have like, you know, this halal income, no interest, whatever and stuff, like no debts and stuff like that, and they're good. Um, so those ones, let's say, uh, you get them, you buy them at a certain price, the price, as, as the price is increasing, we need to tell ourselves that you know, this is increase in price is actually indicating that this, you know, the stock is, it has some value. This company has some value. The service that they're providing has some value and that we can like, you know, that this is a good thing. So if you buy it at a higher price necessarily, it doesn't, you know, from your starting point, right? It doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. In, in fact, that the price going higher and higher is actually indicating that there is potential, there's movement going on and that this has a lot of opportunity of growth and stuff. But if, you, if the stock is sort of like coming back to the original price that you bought it at, then that's actually showing you that this this stock is not valued right now and it's not actually going to bring you much money and stuff. Like that. So although you might get a bargain by buying it the same price as you had initially, that is also showing you that the stock is actually not performing well and that you should get out of that and get to a different stock that's actually having momentum build up and stuff. Right? So you'll see this um, a lot happening to yourselves. So just keep in mind that you treat each, you know, each transaction separately the first time you bought it. So from that point onwards, see the progress that's happening. The second transaction that you have, it might be like, you know, $15 higher. That's okay. But see if from that $15, the higher price, that new price that you bought at, see where that price goes from that point onwards, right? And if it comes back to the same point, then you know this pro this stock may not be as great and you need to then buy a different stock or whatever, get out of that one, right? Um, but if it keeps going higher from that new starting point that you got into, um, then in that case, you see, okay, this is still moving forward. Let me buy again. So you buy again and that price moves again. Then you're like, you know, this is like a transaction that you're doing. So there's like these increments that you're looking at every time you buy a new stock um, or every time you buy stocks from the same, you know, or uh, you buy more stocks from the same company, for example, right? Um, and so this is something to keep in mind that, you know, sometimes uh, our analysis paralysis, for example, makes us feel like, um, uh, makes us actually lose opportunities. So we have passing opportunities that we're not taking advantage of. And you'll see this when it comes to Deen and Dawa, for example. Um, you might see, for example, you're a certain, a certain number of years old, right? And you feel like, man, I, you know, it's too late now for me and stuff. But it's not too late, right? Because you might think, for example, if I had gotten in 
when their stock price was at twenty dollars, right? When I had gotten in when I was twenty years old, um, then I would have then you know gotten this far and stuff like that, right? By the end of like ten years or whatever and stuff, right? But you see, if you treat every transaction separately, meaning every opportunity entry point separately, and see how much progress you can make from that point onwards, then then you're gonna look at it from a different way. So if you have price anchoring in stocks, uh, in stocks, we also have uh, like age anchoring or like you know, up, you know these kinds of anchors that we put down in our in our stuff. So we actually don't end up studying Dean because we're like you know it's too late now and stuff or whatever whatever. But we're not actually seeing the progress we can make from that point that we're in right now onwards and how it can impact our life so there's a fallacy that needs to be uh, cut out right there so that analysis paralysis is is messed up is messing up this over here this this dean and dawa you know interaction if you didn't you know catch the wave for example the first time around but the waves are still moving forward then jump on the train right why would you not do that why would you say like well i i'm not gonna like i didn't make a thousand percent on this but you know now i'm only gonna make like 500 percent on this that's still a lot more than where you're standing currently right and actually, if you think about it from the other way, if you miss this opportunity, you have this opportunity cost, right? So in this case, if you miss the 500%, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow that 500 might become 400. So you actually lost 100% that you could have gotten if you entered today, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, it gives you more incentive to actually go forward, right? So if a stock has not reached this maximum point, right? Um, then in that case, you still have, but you know, time to go up. So we just keep entering into it until it gets to whatever peak. And many stocks may not get to their peaks and stuff, right? Um, the um, the the stock that um, uh, Warren Buffett has, uh, it, it, I think it's like like eighty three thousand dollars or something like. I think it's even more than that um, per per stock, right? And so the numbers will keep going. And what they'll do is they split up the stocks and they break them down into like you know um, like they have a guy splitting. So like uh, Tesla recently had one. And Apple recently had one where the individual stock price was a lot higher, um, and then they split it up so that um, everyone, uh, every share, every stock uh, was divided into like four or five pieces. So then you had five times as many stocks, but your net worth was still the same because the price of each stock was like one fifth or one fourth or whatever and stuff, right? So then it became easier for people to enter again. But they're what they call market cap how much money is invested in that company, for example. Um, with stocks uh, that it keeps increasing right so you want to make sure that you, you remember here that dean opportunities service opportunities business opportunities relationship resolution opportunities are like the same way right uh, the last one relationship resolutions you can ha you, you can resolve the matter immediately like you know right on the spot right or, or you can uh, you know unpack or sort of like resolve whatever conflicts that you're having like in this case right here with the negative memory anchors and how you were putting in your like proverbial bag and stuff right so that became your baggage that you were just carrying on in life and how it was sort of like every day was like dragging you down and it was limiting your you know movement forward so every time you added something more or every time every day that you didn't actually resolve that thing that you had initially put in it, it impacted you negatively and that negative uh, impact is going to accumulate over the course of time over the course of the next few days and so on and months and years and whatever and decades even right so if you don't resolve resolutions or if you don't uh, resolve these uh, uh, relationship issues then what happens is that drag that it has on you it's going to continue to accumulate and it's going to become harder for you um to like resolve it later on because you're going to be feel more embarrassed or you're going to feel like you know more awkward about like resolving and stuff like that even though that should not ever like be an excuse for you but every day that you keep on doing this it's going to delay your um, positive progress essentially so this is called analysis paralysis right this is where price anchoring happens for stocks this is what happens same up same thing happens with dean and star you know for service for example you might say uh, all these things are already happening and stuff now i can't do something and stuff like that because everyone's already done it right um so what am i going to do what new things am i going to bring it's, it may not even be about new things it might be that you might just come in and actually expand the effort even more and you coming into the picture might make it even better because now there's an extra person that wasn't there before so we can actually fast track or accelerate the progress of whatever goals or the progressive progression towards certain visions and goals and stuff that we had originally with that service objective or a project or whatever it was right same thing with businesses you might look at products and you might say well you know it looks like a good product let me find the best you know best supplier let me just kind of find the cheapest person and stuff you keep on doing that until 
10 years go by you know like i find the perfect person now and stuff right and uh let me let me come in now because this is the lowest price that's ever been because there's been like you know improves improvements in like technology in terms of manufacturing and so on so now it's really easy to buy this product but 10 years later the value or that like, you know the, the um the like the market need or like you know demand for this product may not be as much as it was before so yeah you you're gonna save like you know 30 more cents and stuff 10 years from today but you're not gonna make as many sales and so you ended up losing in terms of profits so this is where they say don't get don't like over analyze and be stuck same thing with messages and stuff with our organizations where they're like sitting in there and just discussing the same topic over and over again before making a decision for like a very long time then they're gonna have these analysis paralysis uh, these analyses paralysis because of the fact that they're not actually making decisions that can impact today instead of yesterday or like you know uh, sorry instead of like you know 10 days from today uh, meaning in the future so make a decision today um, do do look at things and stuff do evaluate but don't uh, put, put a cutoff date like a realistic practical cutoff date don't let it go on forever this is also related to uh, statistics where people um, uh, get overwhelmed for example if they, uh, people would get overwhelmed if they were to survey an entire population so they look at samples they look at representative samples because it's a lot easier i would need for example like many years decades to evaluate how many people in the entire world would like uh, a pink m m to come out right and uh, if i were to go around to the entire world getting that data it'd be very very time consuming very resource demanding and so on it might take a long time but if I do a survey, a representative survey, and just kind of get like maybe 90% conviction, right? 90% uh, confidence that this is going to be that, that, then I can actually make a decision on that and I'll, I'll be good to go. And it might take me maybe like one or two months of research maximum and I'm done. Right? Um, so this is something to keep in mind that um, you want to make sure that you keep, moving, you keep moving and don't get analysis paralysis and make sure that you're seeing the actual benefit left over instead of looking at the harm that you've had. Uh, there have been studies, and I'm going to conclude with this in Java, that focus on, for example, people are more um, more likely to prevent a harm, right? Uh, more, more, they're more likely to be worried about preventing a harm than they are in terms of um, enjoying a benefit that they would get otherwise, right? So that's why that's that's one um, that's uh, that 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 relates to one of the legal maxims in Islam that if you have uh, two options that are presented to you, right? And, or there's a case where there's like something's happening and you have to either address you can only pick one of the two and one of the things is that you have you can uh, um, ward off a harm that is impending or that is currently there um, or is potentially going to happen um, or you can bring a benefit to you know to your constituents for example or whoever the stakeholders are so in this case if you have to pick one of the two things and you don't have a third choice or whatever and stuff right then in that case you can pick the one that is going to remove the harm and that you have to pick that one before you focus on bringing in the benefit. So in Islam, you have to remove the harm before you focus on bringing the benefit. If you have those two options and those are the only two options and stuff, and you don't have like space to make a third decision and so on, uh, and this is similar to the concept of um, picking, uh, you know, uh, picking the lesser of two evils in a situation. Now, now most people actually misunderstand this legal maxim in Islam. The the actual maxim is that if there are only two choices that you have, there's no third option, right? That you cannot just sit back, for example, you can you cannot make a third decision or that you cannot make a decision that, that you already are, you're not allowed to make no decision essentially, right? So you have to pick two things and if you don't pick two things and that's, you know, like it, this is it, like you, you have only two choices in this matter. There's no third or fourth or fifth choice and stuff, right? So in that case, if one of them is bring, if both of them are evil, then you pick the one that's lesser of the two evils. But it does not apply in the case where there is a third option present. For example, you can step back and not make a decision because you're not required to make a decision, right? Um, so there's, you know, then that's the, that's something to keep in mind that there are these legal maxims in Islam, but they have to be understood properly. But anyways, the point over here again is in summary is that you analyze things and stuff, you make a decision, and you keep moving forward and look at the benefit that you would get, the incremental benefit that you would get. Um, as you get involved in certain things, for example, Dean, service related of business, relationship resolution and stuff, don't delay it. Uh, get into those opportunities whenever they are there, as long as they're an upward trend, essentially, that, you know, or in the grand scheme of things, not day to day. You don't do, you know, generally, you don't do stocks, you know, day to day. You do them over, you know, a few days or a few months or a few years and stuff. Generally, it's, you know, a longer term. But nonetheless, you want to make sure that 
you look at a stock that has like you know continues to go higher you look at opportunities um, to resolve you know conflicts and resolution in like relationships and stuff do them as soon as possible because um, the later it is the more difficult it becomes so reframe it think about the positives and don't think about it as much as a, as a negative because we are usually primed to remove the harm and so we are thinking that if I get into this opportunity and I don't like like for example stocks I'm gonna not make as much as I would have if the price was closer to the original, right? So that that's something where there's a flaw because I need to reframe that, and instead of look, looking at the harm, instead of becoming paranoid, instead of becoming negative and toxic and stuff, instead of looking instead of looking at things in a negative way, I need to reframe it, start looking at things in a positive way. What positive things that can I get out of this, right? Um, and this is where there is a strong positive thing. In the case where there's a strong negative thing, and the benefit is very little. Right? Then in that case, obviously, we're not going to get involved in those things. But in this case, when their matters are not as clear cut as that, or there is a strong positive that you're going to get in terms of benefit, and the harm that you're going to get is actually more of a perceived harm, but not an actual real harm, right? Like the stock example that I gave, or the Dean example that I gave, or the other examples that I give, you're still going to make benefit, and you're still going to get a lot of progress, um, but it's not going to be um, as much as it was in the first case. But that's okay because what you're perceiving harm in that case is how much you've missed not actually how much you're going to get hurt in the future so you're actually you know misunderstanding when you when you're you know looking at it like that in the negative perspective you're actually incorrectly assessing the, the weight of the negative stuff so you're actually saying that the what i've what i have already lost right is something that's going to harm me but whatever you've already lost is not going to harm you in the future necessarily um, if you can get into that thing and get benefit out of that thing, right? So the loss that you are the the loss of opportunity, instead of making a thousand dollars, now I'm going to only make nine hundred dollars. That in itself is looking at the glass half full, right? Uh, no, sorry, that's that's looking at it as half empty, like it's still empty, it's not full yet, right? What if what if, what if um, but on the other hand, if you flip it around, you're going to look at it as half full. You're looking at it more optimistically, right? And that's how you should, because if the glass is actually staying is, is actually increasing in terms of like the, the amount that's in it right if it is increasing but you're looking at it as how much it's uh, it's away from the full right then you're looking at it from a negative even though it's actually getting closer towards a positive right so this is what you need to reframe a glass half full if it's actually has been increasing for a long time the trend is actually upward so run on that trend right um, don't look at it as well it hasn't reached the top yet right if the trend is up you still have opportunity to go up if the trend was downwards, then that's a different thing, right? And even in that case, you can reframe it to think of it as a positive. So I hope with this, inshallah, um, you have found some benefits and that you have learned how to reframe a lot of the things that we sort of like to by default get stuck in. And you've taken that um, we are by default, uh, we, we by default sort of focus on avoiding harm, right? And then sometimes we miss uh, assign harm we sort of like misunderstand and misallocate harm to something that might actually be positive, but we're looking at that positive thing in a negative way. And that doesn't make any sense, right? Uh, it doesn't make any sense in, in the sense that it makes sense why we do this, um, why we fall into this fallacy, but it doesn't make sense in terms of how it should be. So reframe, readjust your mindset and stuff, you know, sort of question why you have certain negative perspectives and certain things and stuff, right? Look at the validity, does it make sense? But should it be like this or should it not be like that? And then make decisions accordingly. Don't become uh, stuck in, you know, with the analysis paralysis, but um, just make sure that you're moving forward and continuously assess yourself and make sure that you have realistic expectations and not unrealistic ones. And make sure you have end goals in mind. If you have profit in mind, if you have, you know, benefit and service, or, you know, whatever and stuff like that in mind, then make sure that you take advantage of opportunities that are going to give you that benefit, even if it's a little bit. Um, and, and don't think that the opportunities that you have missed, right, are defining of what, you know, uh, they should determine whether you should get into these opportunities that are left over or not, right? Just because you missed 10 years of studying Dean, it doesn't mean that you cannot spend another 10 years in, or that you shouldn't spend another 10 years in Dean, right? You can't, you can just jump in and say, okay, well, I have whatever life I have, I can still benefit whatever's left over. Um, I shouldn't just like say, well, I missed it, so I should not do it at all, period, and stuff, right? So just keep that in mind, Shaitan is gonna put out these tricks in front of you, and a lot of times we're not paying attention, so we actually get caught in the traps. Um, so with that, inshallah, homework is again to make sure that you're, you're reevaluating every thought process that you have, looking at things and trying to question whether it makes sense or not, um, where it should be like that or not, and then ask other people for, you know, consultation and so on. So Islam is heavy on shura, 
a consultation so make sure you guys get into that as well inshallah if you have discussions if you need advisors if you need to connect with people just whatever uh, just make sure that you are open to uh, feedback from others and stuff like that but do it in a way where you're saying okay what can i grow in and how can i grow as opposed to what am i like you know um, like instead of feeling embarrassed or something like that whatever inshallah so remember your objectives if you have clear objectives positive goals you can work towards them inshallah so with that subhanakum wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik jazakumullah khairan assalamu alaykum